Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if the bell has been ringing or not, or the, do they do that in just a second? It will. Okay. Good morning. I'm Pastor Joanne Sorensen, and I'm visiting with you today. Some of you may remember from way back in the last century when I was a pastor here. <laughs> when I was a pastor here at, um, beginning in 1992. It's just so good to visit with you. Um, pastor Kira is away today, so um, here I get to be here with you. And so there's some announcements. Oh, they were up there, but I know they're on your bulletin. Um, does somebody say those, or should I just point them out? They're in the back of your bulletin. Um, a globe offering for the ELCA disaster relief. April 18th, a National Day of Prayer, clergy lunch. April 20th, there's a highway cleanup. There's a sign-up sh sign sheet located in the narthex. And on the 21st, there's communion um, with also First Communion. Um, so I guess you can read the rest of the announcements. Did the bell ring? I don't want to miss it. <laughs> Oh, he's going to do that now. And so we welcome God's presence here today. The Lord be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Why don't you take a moment to share the peace of Christ with one another before we sing our opening song. You may be seated as we sing our song. Probably should stand up.
Come as you are into the presence of God. Let the mystery of God's love transform you. We confess our sins before God and one another. Risen God, we confess to you, to ourselves, and to one another that we have caused harm by the things we have said and done and by the things we have not said and not done. Take away our sins that we might fully embody your commandment to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. In grace and mercy, God forgives all our sins and with joy and expectation calls us into new life for the sake of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, in and through Jesus, you reached out in healing love to all who came to you for help. Empower us now to extend that same healing love to one another, our community, and the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to invite any kids that are here to come on up. I have a song to teach you. Oh, wow, great to see you. And what's your name? Jackson? And Noel Easton, what great names. So today we're going to hear a story in just a minute about what happened in the days just after Jesus was resurrected, just after he rose from the dead. His disciples were trying to figure out, what do we do now? What's next? And they really didn't know. They didn't really have a list of things that Jesus gave them to do. But they went and did what they knew to do, which is to go to the temple and pray. And that day that they went to the temple, they had an amazing experience. Do you know what happened? You didn't read ahead or anything? So what they did was walk to the gate called the Beautiful Gate before they went into the temple, and there was a man who couldn't walk. Now, do you have any idea what might have happened? Well, Peter and John looked at him, and Peter said, get up and walk, and he did. And someone wrote a song about it. So Peter said, you know what, I don't have any silver or gold. I think he was just saying, I don't have a lot of wealth, but here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a gift from God so that you can stand and walk. So here's the words to the song. It says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And then the chorus says, they went walking and leaping and praising God. Do you guys want to walk and leap? <laughs> well, I think you should. Come on, stand up. So we're going to figure out how to do the actions to this song, which means let's just walk down to the baptismal bowl there and back. That's the first part, walking. This is not a hard concept. And then you walk back, and then it says they were leaping. So can you walk back there and then jump on your way? There we go. Perfect. Now, that, now after they were leaping, they were praising God. So you have to lift up your arms and look to the heavens. All right, so now I'm going to play this song, and when you get to that part, you've got to walk and leap and praise God. Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He asked for alms and held out his palms, and this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold, have I none? Almost there. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Okay, walk. Walking and leaping and praising. Walking and leaping and praising. They've got it. <coughs> in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Perfect. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And you guys did it, walking and leaping and praising God. Thank you. That was great. I appreciate that. You can go sit down. Oh, you're off to, to learn more. They did a great job. Did, you, did, they know, did they know that song? Did you know that song? No? It's an old song. That's great. Okay. <laughs> nice to see you. Good to see you. The first reading is from Mark chapter 6, verses 53 to 56. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesart and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, People at once recognized him and rushed about that the whole region began to bring the sick on mats wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages or farms, they laid the sick on marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Here ends the lesson.
questions. A reading from Acts chapter 3. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And as he entered the temple with them, he was walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. In the early days that followed Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the disciples were being prepared by the Holy Spirit to take on the amazing task of creating a new community. At this point in time, they were worshiping in the temple. And you have to remember, these were Jewish men, and Jesus was too. And they know the importance of prayer, so before they do anything else, Peter and John do what they already knew to do. They went to pray at 3 o'clock. At this point, they had no knowledge of what was next to come in this new community and what it would even look like. No instruction books. Jesus hadn't left, left them a list of things to do. They didn't even have any church organizing documents. No church council president to sit down and talk to them like I had when I came here years ago. They had to rely completely on the leading of the Holy Spirit. And even though they didn't know what this new community was going to be like, they did know what they had seen and heard when they were with Jesus. They knew a love like they had never known before. They knew that Jesus was about healing and forgiveness. They had watched him over the previous few years, and they knew what to expect. They knew their lives had been turned upside down and that the world would never be the same. Jesus' death and rising had changed everything. Their lives were different. Jesus wasn't about keeping the old law. Jesus' work was to make all things new. New relationships, new possibilities, new ways of understanding the world. So as they approached the temple that day and came up to the gate they called beautiful, there was a beggar. And now you have to know if you're in Israel, that's where the beggars would sit always, was by the gates. And then when they saw this beggar, this lame man, I'm thinking that Peter, as he looked at him, was remembering what happened when Jesus was at his house. Remember that story when they lowered the man in through the roof who was healed? Peter was probably remembering what Jesus did for that lame man. And as Peter was looking at this, <clears throat> at this lame man, I'm guessing he probably was remembering that Jesus had gone to his mother-in-law who was laying on her deathbed and took her by the hand and she stood up and began to make food for them. All of these memories were in Peter's mind as he looked at this man and immediately he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. He took him by the hand and this man stood up and then began to leap. What an amazing new reality. They were trying to be attentive to the Holy Spirit, their new leader. And they knew that new things are going to be happening now. The old structures were falling away. There were rules that were important before that were going to be changed. 
In just a few chapters down the line here in Acts, we will learn that the community of believers would be different. Jews and Gentiles, who would never be caught together, would be worshiping together. And even women would be allowed to be leaders. There are hints of that all over the New Testament. What next? And then outcasts, like lepers or people who were ill, were to be allowed into the community. It would be an entirely different experience, a new order. I've had the experience over this past week that was further evidence of this new order, a change from the way things used to be. When your pastor called me a few days ago and asked if I could come this Sunday, she asked if I would share some stories from this trip that I just returned from. And she said that she's real interested in taking some of you on this same trip, so I was happy to do that. I returned just a week ago from a trip to Alabama. We traveled to Montgomery and to Selma and to Birmingham. <coughs> in Montgomery, we heard the story of Rosa Parks who in 1955 refused to move to the back of the bus because she was black. Now you have to know that she didn't just decide that day to do that. The black community had been talking about this and preparing for what she did for a long time. So when Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to move to a different part of the bus, the whole black community boycotted the buses. They figured out other ways to get to work, and half of the city of Montgomery quit riding the bus. Well, it took over a year, but the laws changed, and eventually there was integration and everyone could ride the buses. Then we went on to Selma, and we listened to the story of a, a foot soldier. A foot soldier is someone who walked the bridge with Mar Martin Luther King in 1963. There was a man named Kirk Carrington who was 13 years old when he walked the bridge in the Montgomery March. But I didn't know that when he chose to join his friends and prepare for the march across the bridge and on into Montgomery, he was taken to a camp for his efforts to prepare for this march. There were camps. Well, they weren't summer camps. They were detention camps. Lots and lots of youth were brought to camps outside the city of Selma and held with very little food, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks. Their parents didn't know where they were, but eventually they went home. Often the adults who chose to pay, take part in the march like this were punished. They lost their jobs. Many people lost their jobs. And these march preparations were organized by the church. And there were many young people that took part, even teenagers, and they all learned about the power of peaceful resistance to rules that were unjust. Amazing stories. Then we went on to Birmingham and we listened to a woman named Carolyn tell her story. She was close friends with the four girls who died in the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in September of 1963. That experience changed her life forever. Back in those days, they didn't send counselors to the schools to discuss what happened. And the black community was constantly terrorized by bombings and threats, so nobody talked about what happened. So she went through her young adult years and on into college with no discussion about this tragedy that had happened to her. And she struggled for years with depression. She struggled to know how it could be okay when she was taught by her parents and her adults to obey rules, to obey her parents, and how someone could do something so terrible and not be held accountable. She couldn't figure that out. And she couldn't figure out why the same day that that tragedy happened, two young black boys who were playing outside were killed by police. She couldn't put those things together. How could this be, she thought. What's wrong with the world? When we read the book of Acts, we find out 
that after Jesus left, the Holy Spirit was in charge of the church. And when the Holy Spirit is in charge, the rules change. A new order is established. New community is built. And people who were separated before come together. What these several civil rights pilgrimages have taught me is a deeper understanding and appreciation of the concept of beloved community as it was taught by Dr. King in the 1960s. He taught that there's this thing called beloved community and it's based on the book of John and beautifully illustrated in stories like the one we just read today. That all people across lines of race or belief or ethnicity can live together in harmony and learn from one another. It's hard to even imagine listening to the news these days that that could still actually be true. And I believe that it's still possible. Maybe I'm an eternal optimist or maybe a hopeless dreamer, but that's the picture that we're taught in the book of Acts. And furthermore, I want to believe this because in Acts, so soon after Jesus' resurrection, there's this moment of clarity that Peter and John seem to have when they go into the temple on this day. Suddenly, this moment of complete truth about who God is and what God wants for humanity. And then they spoke to that man and he started to walk. It's a reminder for us for the need to place our souls deep into the soil of Jesus' death and resurrection. I love that song today, Give Me Jesus. To place ourselves into Jesus' death and resurrection and to remember the deep soil of this kind of community and that it is possible, not because as people we're finally going to get our act together, but because God's love is so great and because God's love for the whole world is that great. And because there's a great amount of spiritual power in not returning violence for violence. The people in Selma and Montgomery and Birmingham learned, not easy, learned the principles of not reacting in the face of constant violence, and it was powerful and changed the rules. I also want to think about the idea of beloved community because in some ways it seems like as a culture, we're in such a painful place. Just a few weeks ago, I attended a conference by an ELCA Committee on Racial Justice. They had their meeting in Minneapolis, and we spent some time at George Floyd Square hearing from the black community leaders who organized after George Floyd's murder and who are leaders today trying to get a permanent memorial in that space. It was obvious that these leaders had come to really know one another and to love one another and were trying to navigate around the frustration that they were feeling. I also want to learn this concept of true beloved community because, because of people like you. You here were some of the people who trained me as a pastor way a long time ago and I still am today. But if the world God loves truly means male and female, black and white, people of all faiths learning to get along, then we have to find ways to live together, to support one another, and to be reminded constantly that Christian community is different than the hostility that we see in the world. When we sang some songs at the 16th Street Baptist Church, I heard this old Baptist song, Maybe some of you have heard it. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my sin rolled away. It was there, by faith, I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Well, the first step in that beloved community is certainly allowing the burden of sin to roll away, but it also means more than just individually because trauma lives in communities as well. And so we have to find ways to work together to find this kind of healing. And maybe the first step in this type of community is to find ways to reach out to the community to bring that healing. If the first step is finding healing from trauma, maybe the second step is to help others walk away from the trauma they've experienced. 
I read a story about a woman named Shannon Martinez, and she was a member of a neo-Nazi group in Georgia. She said that she joined the group because the ideology was seductive and made her feel strong and empowered. For her, the world felt like a brutal place, and the group made her feel as though she was a part of something bigger. But then she says, after five years in this way of life, I began to see how I was continually looking at the world from my place as a victim. By blaming everyone else, it didn't make me feel any safer. It just kept my world really small and kept me focused on my own hurt and pain. Now, as Shannon speaks to other white nationalist groups, she finds that in every case, she can identify people with trauma that has never been healed. Part of the process for her means identifying the trauma and then finding new behaviors. Shannon said that by joining a hate group, it kept her focused on the pain and hurt in her own life. But thank God we don't have to live that way. Because if we've experienced the tomb with Jesus and walked with him into death, then we can walk out of the tomb and be raised with him into new life. That's the promise that we have in our baptism. For Shannon, being alive meant letting go of being a victim and letting go of the hurt. Sometimes that's difficult to do, but it's a necessary step so that we can get to be loving community. What is it that you need to let go of to experience more of this kind of community? Or maybe it's not letting go of something. Maybe it's taking something on. Maybe it's using some of your time to volunteer in a way that you haven't done before. Or maybe if you're an older adult, it's spending some quality time with a child as a mentor or a teacher. Or maybe if you're really busy, like I used to be when I was younger, it's taking a break and grabbing a friend and going on a day trip and enjoying being outdoors in this beautiful spring. God loved the world so much that Jesus came here to show us what it was like. And then he passed this love along to the disciples so that Peter and John could speak to a lame man and watch him be healed. And that was only one day in their life in the temple. Soon there would be more miracles and a much larger understanding of how great God's love really is. So my hope and prayer is that every day you might see more examples of this love in action in every place you are. And then in the places you go, you can bring that type of love to the people that you meet. That is my prayer for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us sing with high delight and stand if you are able.
trusting in the promise of resurrection, we pray for the church and for the world and for everyone in need. Healing God by your power, Peter was able to liberate a man from the need to beg for his survival. Give us the power to transform <laughs> lives and systems so that all your children have what they need to flourish. God of life, in mercy, hear our prayer. Within the complexity and beauty of the world you created can be found sources of life and healing we have yet to encounter but which could be transformative to humanity. Help us to preserve and protect the gifts you have given us in nature. God of new life, in mercy, hear our prayer. Move the leaders of wealthy nations to provide health and humanitarian aid wherever it is needed and commit them to addressing the international inequities that cause these health crises in the first place. God of new life, Strengthen all who are experiencing challenges to their health and well-being and all who provide care to them. Especially today, we pray for healing for Mackenzie and her daughter, Sophia, Samuel Roglu, Darlene Sondheim, Karen Holt, Carter Hayward, Diane Lundell, Janine Hayward, and Joanne Ferrier. God of new life, We uplift all who do not have access to health care, both in our own country and throughout the world. Make us advocates for this essential human need so that every one of your beloved children might be cared for as you would care for them. God of new life. Thank you, Lord, for those who have gone before us, who have been healers in our lives. In their footsteps, may we engage in the healing practice of our faithful presence with those around us. God of new life, hear our prayer. We place in your arms all for whom we pray, out loud or the, those prayers deep in our hearts, confident that you will hear us in your mercy and love. And so together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May be seated as we receive our offering. plate somewhere. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't see him. Thank you.
Let us pray. Excuse me. Let us pray. Generous God, we return to you <clears throat> out of your abundant gifts, these offerings of our possessions, as well as our time and our talents. Use them for the sake of a world in need, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. We come asking for what we think we need. Enough money, enough time, enough approval. And then in Jesus' name, we are given infinitely more than we could have imagined. Our faith is renewed. Enough sustenance, enough trust, enough love. And we find ourselves leaping and praising God. Amen. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. And our closing song, please stand. Hallelujah. Go in peace. Rejoice and be glad. Thank you, Jesus. Happy Easter.